Welcome to Church Online. I am so excited that you have joined us this morning. I'm Pastor Matt. I pray that our worship will be exciting and uplifting. I pray that the ministry of the Word will work in your heart and that the Lord will do something special. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the service. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I have, though, I've been thinking, pondering uh, on this book for quite some time. And, and really, it, it's just for obvious reasons. In one sense, you think about it, it's a port city. You know, there's a lot of similarities between Baltimore and Corinth. Uh, but mainly, I would say the, the group of people that are described in the book uh, would fit the description of Baltimore and <laughs> in a lot of ways. And so I think that, you know, we all know that we don't live in the poshest of areas. You know, we live in, in a more... Uh, I would say blue collar, um, maybe even what some would consider rougher area. And I'm not saying that. You know, I live here. I'm just saying what people say when they come and visit me. <laughs> like my family, you know. For instance, they come and they're like, oh, this is nice. And I can tell that they're like not really saying that this is nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, oh, this is your house. Yeah, yeah, this is... And especially when, when, like our first home, like we were in the heart of Dundalk in Charles Mott, and for us, it was the Taj Mahal. It was what we could afford, you know? And, uh, but, but it's definitely not uh, endearing to everyone, but it is to me. This is home. And this is where the Lord has called us. And, and we, take, we take pride in our area. We take pride in our city. And we take pride in what the Lord is doing. And so did the Corinthians. Um, but really, when, when you look at the similarities, there's so many. There's so many things that we can draw from and, and see a connection to. Uh, and so I'll say this to you. As we study, as we walk through this book, read, read with us. Maybe set aside a day in your Bible reading. And, and maybe it's just a day to read the chapter that we're going to go through. Um, and this morning, we're just going to cover chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Uh, which is the greeting. That's all it is. And, and so this should only be a 10, 15 minute message. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but I say all that to say, it's, it's literally, uh, you know, kind of split up in sections. And so I'll talk about that. But if you just want to set aside a Monday or a Tuesday or maybe even Saturday, the day before the service, uh, to just read the portion of scripture that we're going to be going over and preaching through, I, I think that you'll really benefit from that, and, and you're going to learn a lot. I've learned so much already just diving in and getting my feet wet, and I haven't even begun. Um, so, but I'll, I'll say this. There are challenges. That there are challenges, strong challenges that Paul is going to put our feet to the proverbial fire. You know, he, he's going to want a, a change. He's going to want something to be different than it was when he first got there or when he first got started. Um, and so we, we can go ahead and make the decision now, like, Lord, if you show me something, like if you reveal something to me in the text, I'm going to respond in the right way. And, and if you can just determine that in your heart that I know there's going to be some things. How many know that there are areas in your life that are probably not where the Lord wants them? Anybody? I know my, both my hands and feet. John Jay, it's good to see you. How was vacation? Good, 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 good. Uh, but, but both hands, feet, all of them are in the air in, in, in the sense that I know, D, I know there are areas that like the Lord has yet to redeem them. And I think maybe there are certain parts of my heart that he's like, ah, we'll come back to that. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like when you like if I'm sanding a hardwood floor, I'm like I'm not going to run right into the closets and do all that handwork. I'll just I'll leave it for a little while. You know, maybe the car that you're renovating, you know, and buffing, it's like, "Ah, I'll come back to that quarter panel. That's pretty rough." How many of us have places like that in our hearts where we're like, "Man, that's a rough spot." You know the Lord wants to redeem it. You know the Lord wants to extract that, do some work and put it back, but it just hasn't happened yet. This is a great opportunity, a great opportunity, because I feel like there's like no stone unturned in this book. And of course, we'll go from 1 Corinthians into 2 Corinthians, but, but we're going to get a list. I'm going to sh share with you this morning, uh, and, and this message is going to be kind of, it is an introduction, but it is it stands on its own. Today's message definitely stands on its own. Uh, but, but you're going to see the topics and the things that Paul is going to unearth. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, 
And he says, hey, that's your chapter. Those are your things. Let's just make the decision now uh, that we're going to respond in the right way. Yes, the, yes, those areas are hard. They're deep. They're, they're problemsome. But we're going to deal with them. Now, now is the time. Let's jump in here. Uh, so right from the program, let's just go ahead and read. It's only nine verses. Let's go ahead and read the text together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The greeting and the thanksgiving. Uh, and I start in verse 1. Paul called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. I love that. I love the way Paul always says, uh, typically some sort or some version of this. He says, look, I'm an apostle, and, and there's authority that comes with that, right? He says, I'm an apostle called by the will of God. Paul is saying, I'm not writing or ministering to you by my own will. I'm writing and ministering to you by the will of God. He's called me. Lest we forget. Oh, this is so funny. Let's see if I can remember what it said. Uh, we, went, we went up to Lancaster or Lancaster with the kids. And uh, we drove by this. This is probably a Mennonite church. And it said on their, I, it said on their marquee, I wish I was Paul. On the road to demask us. <laughs> <But I'm bunched. laughs> now we're there. We are demasked. But yeah, that's what it, that's what it said the other day. That was clever. Uh, anyway, but, but consider the fact that Paul was headed in an entirely different direction. And his whole life was spun around and changed. So as he's writing them, he's going, listen, <laughs> lest you forget that this wasn't my first choice. I'm here because the Lord's called me and equipped me, and, and he, he's, he has brought me to you to, you know, really make an impact, so to speak. So, so I'm not here because I, this is my first decision and my career choice, right? He's like, I'm called to be an apostle. I, I love that. Verse 2, to the church, oh, okay, whoa, whoa, easy, Matt, read what's there, and Sosthenes, our brother. Uh, Sosthenes was flogged and beaten in the court. This is really, uh, you're going to find that this part in the story is Acts chapter 18. You know that the book of Acts is, is like the 30, first 30 years of the church. So Acts is just like a history book. And then all the letters, you know, to the church of Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, all those letters fit into the timeline in the book of Acts. So if you wonder where Corinthians fits in in the timeline for Paul's ministry, it's his second missionary journey. Uh, and he is, it's in Acts chapter 18. So if you're reading in Acts chapter 18, that's the parallel here to this time. And we see Sosthenes mentioned here and in Acts chapter 18, and he is a leader and elder, and, and he is endured. He, he's endured great things. Many think that he is, uh, what, what, what was I going to say there? I was headed in, in a direction uh, with that. Uh, oh, the co-author. He is helping Paul. And we know that Paul had some sort of issue. Uh, many think it was his eyesight. Poor eyesight. Not, not quite sure. Uh, but Sosthenes here is addressed. And, and this is the way that books, uh, letters rather, are bookend with the greeting basically as saying, these are the people who wrote it. And, and this was a collaboration, Paul and Sosthenes uh, here. And you'll see that in Acts 18. So to the church of God at Corinth, to those, I just love this wording, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints. Now, don't miss this. Let me give you a little clue here. Watch the way he frames his words in, in giving them what may seem like compliments, but they're not. It's like, I'm a saint, right? Look at the way he says, to the saints. But he says, to the church of God at Corinth, he qualifies each statement of God at Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if he's not careful, he'll tell them how awesome they are, and then they won't receive what he's about to say. So he's saying, like, look, you're called saints, but in Christ Jesus. This is not, I'm not writing this to you because you're the church at Philippi. <laughs> that church had some pretty good people in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that church was a blessing to Paul. This church was dysfunctional. I mean, they had some problems. 
But even still, Paul found a way to say, listen, you're still a church in God. And, and watch this. Watch what he does here. This is crazy. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> now do you get the undertones? I thank God for you because of God and what God gave to you. <laughs> it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your goodness. I love that. That you were enriched in him in every way and in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, verse 6, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day, and that's really really what we saw Peter talk about, this day, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 9, God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So before we dive too much in, into this, uh, let's do a little bit of background here. The history of the ancient, the, the history of Corinth, ancient Corinth, is the story of two cities. The old Greek city, and the new Roman Corinth of Paul's timeline. So it's about 150, I think about 150, uh, maybe to 200 years before Paul, this, this city that Paul is now writing to, it was destroyed. Ancient Corinth was a, uh, a, a city in Greece that was this port city. Because of its position, uh, basically it would be between two ports where they would come in to port and then they would transport to the other waterway. Uh, and based on that, that transportation and that transaction, you can see why they were a wealthy city. Why many had to pass through there. And any city that was a main hub of transportation was a main hub for commerce. Was a main hub for sales and for people to uh, make good money. So we find this as a, as a Greek city. And still to this day, uh, and during Paul's day, were remnants left over. The temple to Apollos uh, was still there and somewhat intact. The ancient Greek city, but yet conquered uh, by a Roman general and then left for about 100 years to sit there and rot, uh, we find Rome now colonizes it. Rome now grabs hold of this, and we know that Rome is in charge, right? The Jews are living among, remember Peter's terminology, chosen, living as exiles, they're living in the Roman Empire. They're living in the provinces. So this city, though, was like a spot. Like it was a destination. And in such, uh, that, that governing officials, high-ranking officials, lived there. And so we not only see that this book, typically written to the baser sort, is how Paul would say it, or to the Gentiles that are there at Corinth, there, were, there was also high-ranking officials that went to this church. So there was a mixture of people, uh, and we see that in Acts 18. Uh, but the point is, is this, this is really a tale of two cities. It's a tale of ancient Greece and that culture, that nuance that was still there entrenched in this city. And with that comes, uh, if you've seen like the Disney movie Hercules, right? The, the uh, Hercules, Hercules. Uh, you know, the idea of all those gods and uh, the temples, that type of culture, uh, having temples with, uh, you know, the, the, these temple prostitutes and thousands of them, uh, hundreds. Uh, it's, it's a culture where they uh, were very open sexually, where they were very immoral, right? And then you have this Roman culture that is being infused of strength and systems and government and roadways and restructuring and reorganizing. And so you have uh, a plethora of Jews that are settling, of Roman citizens that are settling, of exiles that are freed slaves that are settling, and then this still nuanced Greek culture that is there. So it's like a hodgepodge of ideologies. It's, it's also, uh, let's see here, one time, here's some quotes from, from a commentary that I think is very helpful. Over time, many different eth ethnic groups migrated to Corinth, including Jews, society of culture and religious plural pluralism that it created, uh, the city's location and cosmopolitan character and tourism all contributed to its wealth and status, issues that clearly plagued the Corinthian church. Look at this. 
Fee, or th this, this uh, theologian here, Fee draws a modern day parallel, and this will give you a really good idea. A modern day parallel by suggesting that Paul's Corinth was at once the New York, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas of the ancient world. So does that really kind of like frame our thinking towards this book? Paul's writing a letter to Vegas. And he's saying what happens in Vegas or what happens in Corinth should not be contrary to what the Lord is doing in your heart. There is no aberration or th th there's no like mulligan here. Just because you're in a cosmopolitan city where there's sin and filth everywhere doesn't mean it's an excuse to live like you want to live. So really just wanting to paint this picture of, of what this looks like, an inner city, a port city, a lot happening, kind of like Vegas. Uh, and, and there are the sources there for these quotes. So Acts 18, we already talked about this, lays out the sequence of events of the beginning of the church at Corinth. Paul arrives here during his second missionary journey. We'll move down the program. Although Jews numbered among the Corinthian believers, the membership of the church was predominantly Gentile, some of whom lived formal, formally shameful lives, and there's the references there. Most of the Corinthians were of low social status, although, the, although there was a core group of persons of rank among them, of rank. Um, we talked about this. Paul's contentious relationship with the Corinthians produced, I love this, and, and this is something to look forward to, right? It produced the most extensive correspondence between an apostle and a local church preserved in the New Testament. So I'm thankful that, that they uh, lived in this type of environment because this really draws out a lot of Paul's ideologies and theology towards the issues that were plaguing this church. And, and I think they're very helpful for us today. So uh, as a result, we know more about the inner workings of the Christian community than any other and possess a rich storehouse of Paul's theology, a thoroughgoing application of the gospel to a litany of real life situations. So here's some of the things that we're gonna be discussing, right? It says it here, uh, wisdom of the cross and the church leadership. That's going to be really chapters uh, right there in, in 110, chapters 110 through chapter 4. So it's going to be talking about the wisdom of Jesus or the wisdom of the cross versus the wisdom of the world. How many know that you need, uh, you need a good definition of what good godly wisdom is? And, and how many could use instruction on tapping into that wisdom versus the wisdom of the world. He's really, he's gonna dig into that, right? The wisdom of the cross uh, and, um, and church leadership. Here's another one he's gonna dig into. The perils of sexual immorality and idolatry. Uh, I mean, he handles it extensively. Marriage and divorce. He talks about marriage and divorce. He talks about evangelism and worship and the greatest enemy of all, death. You know, there were people, I'm, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm going to stick with the program. <laughs> we can ask ourselves this question. Do you see it right there? We can ask ourselves this question as, as we see Paul asking it over and over. What do you mean? Well, th this is what Paul asks. He says, do you not know? <laughs> do you not know? What, what question does Paul ask over and over in this book? Do you not know? He does it in chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6 several times. Uh, you know, chapter 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9 a couple times, and chapter 12. So he's asking this question to them, do you not know? He qualifies it by the greeting and, and the thanksgiving for them, but he's gonna go to the heart of these matters and he's gonna say, do you not know? In other words, I would put it this way, uh, what's your excuse? <laughs> what's, what's your excuse, church at Corinth? Is it the fact that you live in the Vegas of the ancient world? Well, yeah, I'm sure. It's the weekend. I mean, what do you not know? So that question's gonna be asked. And, and here's, I'm not picking on you. I mean, this is great for me. I love going into these book studies. But how many things do we think we know that we just don't quite know? Or, or how many things have we learned? Here it is, a certain way, but that's really not what scripture is saying. And then Paul would say, uh, do you know? And you'd be like, well, I think I know. I, th I think, I, I thought I did. And what Paul is saying once again is, it's not okay. ignorance is not okay. And now where are we? 
<laughs> Where are we? Paul has, uh, Paul wrote them a letter, but guess what? We've, we've got them all. Where are we? And, and so this question is going to be asked over and over. Hey, do you know? Do you know about the wisdom of the cross? Do you know about sexual immorality in the church? Listen, I mean, I'm going to step on some toes. I mean, Paul is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not. It's really him. But, but my point is, is he's going to ask that question. And so uh, will you ask yourself that question without being offended? Right? Just love scripture. Love God's word. Don't be offended by it. Know that it's going gonna, it's gonna to crush all of our toes at times. <laughs> at times it's going to be rough. So we see him asking this question, do, do you not know? Let me ask you this. What qualifies a person to be, and he puts it this way. I'm kind of bouncing back and forth here. He, Paul called an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Look, look at verse number two. To the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints, with all those in every place who call in the name of the Lord Jesus, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let, let me ask you, what qualifies a person? Have you ever asked, asked yourself that question or thought about it? Have you ever asked the question, do you not know what qualifies? <laughs> do you not know? Do you know what qualifies a person to be in the church of God? That's it. But, but we say, oh, just trusting the Lord, just accepting him as our Savior. But then we secretively in our own mind convince ourselves that there's more to it. We convince ourselves that there's actually more to the story than maybe there really is. Listen, what, what is necessary? What qualifies you to be one of these persons that Paul is writing to? Here's another question right there in the program. What affords one protection and grace? Look at what Paul says. He says, grace to you and peace from our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. What affords one protection and grace? And this is me asking these questions. Why? Because I don't want to be like the, the dude at the Church of Corinth where Paul is like, do you not know? I'm, I'm asking more questions. I'm like, man, I, I want to know. I, I want to be in God's grace. I, I want to be in God's family. So I'm asking the question that's being begged here. What, what qualifies us to have that? What qualifies us to understand that we are receiving something from the Lord? And, and why do I want to ask this question now? I want to ask it now because I know what's coming. I've read ahead. This was not a good church. Like, they weren't doing good things. They were doing really, let me just give you a little hint. Like, you had guys sleeping with their mother-in-laws. <laughs> things that make you go, <laughs> I mean it. Like, that's rough, isn't it? That's like, you know, not good content. Like, not good for young audiences here. What's, what's happening in this book? Guys sleeping around with their mother-in-laws. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't know how they got there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. How do we do that? <laughs> so, so I'm just saying, how in God's dear name are we saying that these people are saints? Uh, how are they qualified, Paul, to receive that type of greeting and that type of treatment? Listen, the title of my message today, I don't know if Cody put it in there. He sure did. There may be hope for us yet. That's the title. The title of this first message is, hey, there may be hope if there's dudes sleeping with their mother-in-laws and Paul says, grace be unto you. Man. I mean, I'm not trying to sit in neutral or anything and not head forward in the Lord's grace, but it gives me hope. Listen, and that should give you hope. And I'm, I'm, we're going to get to that, more of that. But... I'm asking the question, what qualifies a person? If this type of behavior is happening, it's here's my point. It's clearly not their behavior that qualifies them. What does one need in order to be in the grace of God? I, I wanted to dive just a little bit deeper. Cody and I were talking about this. Here's what it takes. Here's what it takes to be in the grace of God, in the church of God, and, and gleaning from. It takes declaring your allegiance and loyalty to Yahweh, to Jesus. It, it takes... Saying, 
It's not me, it's you, God. It takes, we, we have a plan of salvation, and in that plan it says that you're the sinner and he is the Savior. Right? So all it takes is saying, I'm declaring my loyalty. I'm putting my faith and trust in you, God, not in me. Listen, that should give us hope. It, it is not in us as far as isolated by ourselves, something that we can do to achieve heaven. No. So look at this word here. He says in verse number two, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, sanctified, called as saints. Does everybody see that word saints? That's the Greek word hagios. It means holy or holy one. To To those sanctified, he says, the church of God called as saints. I just don't see, and and I've heard some say this, that it's to those that actually, maybe there were two or three sprinkled in the church that were actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's not what I'm getting out of this. Paul is making corporate, like 10,000 foot view swaths here over the congregation. He's saying to you saints, he's, it's, it's a collective thing. He's not saying to the two or three that are doing a good job. He's, he's addressing the church. And he's saying here, verse two, called as hagios, called as saints, called as holy ones. <laughs> you came in at just, just your right spot, Cody. This is, this is divine counsel imagery. This is holy one. This is supernatural imagery. This is Paul saying to those of you that are above what your human nature was, you have been called a saint. You have been given an, an, an inheritance that makes you an heir to the throne. You're a son and daughter of the Most High King. Hagios, to you saints, to you holy ones, to you that will help rule in that divine council in the eternal kingdom. Like, it's a high, real high word. Holy and holy one. Here, it also, the same word is the holy place, the temple, the holy of holies, where the Holy Spirit would come and rest which is essentially what we are, right? And Paul's going to use this language later on in the book. He's going to say, you're a temple. You're a a hagios. You're you're an anointed, separated, sanctified, set apart for the purpose that the Holy Ghost is going to come and indwell. That's who you are. What qualifies that? All he says here, here is those sanctified in Christ Jesus who call on the name of Jesus our Lord. He says, you know what? The only thing that qualifies you to be a holy one is if you've called on Jesus. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you've declared your, your dying loyalty to Jesus. And so what, what Paul is saying here is, I got a group of y'all. I have a collective you are the church of God here at Corinth, and you're saints. And I'm thankful for that. But we're going to see that they're not living as saints. They're not. But I want you to understand that Paul sets the tone, the, the, the tone in our life. And, and this is why I think it's very important. Why? Because... If we don't set the right tone with ourselves and with our language and with our speech to ourselves, we're we're dead fish out of water. Why why is that, Pastor Matt? Because, and I'm not talking about this like self-help stuff that is prevalent in our society. You just tell yourself you're amazing. You're the best person ever. You're so good. You just wake up and you look in the mirror and you just say, I'm so glad to be me. <laughs> That's what we're, I mean, just what, what's the new, uh, the new one? TikTok, right? TikTok. Just get on there, whatever it is. And, and that, you're amazing. You're beautiful. Just be positive. 
Nothing but good vibes. Nothing but good vibes. All, all that is language, right? It's language that people are saying you should surround yourself with this kind of language. And you just cut out any negativity from your life and you just be nothing but positive energy. Yes. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying watch the language and the theology that Paul surrounds them with. We, we would do so well. We would do so well. Make this a TikTok really quick. <laughs> we, we would do so good if we would just take the scriptures and formulate our lives around that. I'm not going to try to manipulate and twist scripture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and make that the gold standard in my life and watch what the Lord does. So this is what Paul's doing. Paul knows he's walking into a mess with his pen. He's, been living, he's lived there for about a year and a half, right? He lived in Corinth for about a year and a half with Aquila and Priscilla. Acts chapter 18 says that he, uh, this is kind of tangent, um, follow me, I'm, it's not in the program, but we find that he's, he, he arrives on the scene and he's, he, he is staying with Aquila and Priscilla because they're tent makers together. Paul's in real estate, tent maker. So we find that he's doing work. He's working a secular job with these other people, meeting people and influencing others in this community uh, and starting a church. That's what he did. He arrives on the scene. He's not looking for financial support from others for himself. He himself is using the gifts of his own hands to care for. And so him, Aquila, Priscilla, they start this church, this faith community there. Uh, and he works there for, I think it's about a year and a half. Don't quote me on that specifically, but it says in Acts chapter 18. He's there for a little while. And so my point is, is when he's looking at this church, these baby Christians, if you will, he doesn't say to them, you're perfect. You have it all in you. Everything's good. Now let me show you the things that you need to do. No, he surrounds them with really good theology. He says, in you is not your best self. In Jesus is your best self. You're a saint in Christ Jesus. You have been gifted this thing called the gospel, and I gave it to you, me, Aquila, Priscilla, and all you're doing, and this is next week's message, I'm not gonna get into too much, but he's saying all you're doing is claiming and dropping names. I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos, I'm a disciple of Paul. Remember that, D? They get into this, like, you know, who discipled them, and that's what means everything. Paul's like, let me just set right out of the gate. Here's what matters. Jesus loved you and you declared your loyalty to him, that's why you have any of this. Simply what? Jesus. That's what qualifies a person. That's it. If we start there, anything is possible. If we start there and we surround ourselves with the idea that we're a church of God in Christ and that we have everything we need, all sufficiency in Jesus, Therefore, we will not seek something in and of ourselves that is corrupt anyway. We have to surround ourselves. We have to sniff out with our nose. Paul says, don't you know that? Remember, he's going to keep asking that. Look, we have to sniff out with our noses. Look, and, and many of you sit in the seat of a counselor. A lot of you uh, in this room in, in 9 o'clock are, are counselors to people. You're, you are... Uh, the seasoned veterans, the, the grandkids are coming to you, the great grandkids are coming to you and they're talking. Make sure you surround them with good theology. Don't make excuses for their behavior. Start here and say, you know what? You're a saint because of what Jesus did for you. What does that do? It does several things. But the first thing that it does is it loses the spirit of entitlement that is killing this generation. How many know the spirit of entitlement is wrecking America right now? It's wrecking us. Why? Because they think they're owed something. They think they're amazing. Sesame Street's been telling them. Disney, just watch a Disney movie. Everyone's the most beautiful. Everyone gets a first place trophy. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> you're a loser, you're a winner. Isn't that right, Kai? Come on. We are unable we are unable to deal with life's hard, hard things. Why? Because we have our identity tethered with life's hard things instead of our identity in who Jesus is. This one thing is worth its weight in gold. And, and I've spent entirely too much time on it. <laughs> Here's, look at this. I think this is great. I saw this and I was like, huh, there's got to be more to that. Look at verse number three. 
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We glaze over that, but what is that? That's the priest's prayer over God's people. Paul is literally saying, listen, you might not own it and recognize it yet, but you are holy ones. And the Lord has, has prayed a prayer over you. He has, he's made you priests in his name. And you're not living up to it yet. But it's okay. You will. <sighs> the Lord bless you and keep you. Do you understand? Do you understand, church? Maybe you don't and it's okay. Paul knew. Why? Because he didn't address them specifically. He said, you're the church of God. You don't get it yet. You, you haven't quite grasped the understanding that the Lord has literally given you an inheritance. He's given you a priestly blessing. You're a bunch of Gentiles still running around Vegas, living like you were in times past, but you declared your loyalty to Jesus, and you have to understand something even when you are disloyal to him. He is loyal to you. Whoa. Whoa. That's what Paul's saying. There's time for you to work this out because of his long suffering, not yours. Man. This is the book for us, I'm telling you. This is the book for me. I'm like, thank you, Lord. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not some kind of lucky horseshoe. Why is everything going on? <laughs> like, the Lord, the Lord is making provision for you. The Lord is going before you. If Aaron and his sons were up here and they were ready to pray over you and give you this blessing, they would consider the fact that who they're praying for should understand that. But Paul gave them the benefit of the doubt. Paul said, you don't get this, but this prayer has gone before you thousands of years before it was ever prayed over you. That's some incredible stuff. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing in the church today is Christians singing the blessing because it's a popular worship song, but they don't understand the power behind it. They're still caught in the fact that it sounds good, they don't understand that there's tangible grace and there's tangible peace that goes with that. Wow. Man, may the Lord bless you and protect you. Paul is praying this over them, grace and peace. It's incredible what the Lord has done for us. Listen, church, it's incredible what the Lord has done for us, bringing us into his divine family. It's incredible. Hagias, holy one, sanctified, set apart. Paul then goes on to thank the Lord for them. Now, what makes this outstanding, right, this, this thankfulness between verse four and nine, what makes it mind-blowing is the topics at hand. When you consider what this church is doing behind the scenes that is not good, and Paul knows that, that's why he's writing them, but listen how he still frames this. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. At what point, if we found out some dude was running around with his mother-in-law, would that be how we respond to him? I thank God for you always. The Lord's grace is with you. I know, that, I know that you don't realize it yet or else you wouldn't be doing what you're doing, but the Lord's grace is going before you. Wow. That's why Bethlehem's creed, number one, is lead with what? I, I think we're, we're getting this wrong. We're getting it wrong, a lot. Like we're putting the cart before the horse in some instances and our discipleship does not look like this many times. Unfortunately, churches are more judgmental, right? Than they are constructive and, and helping on the other side of that. Okay, so the outstanding feature here is the particular Thanksgiving, here it is in your program, it's the remarkable optimism that Paul has in his response to the division of the church. Considering the egregious immorality, these, these people, what we're gonna find, they were suing each other. They were taking each other to court. And, and the judge is like, aren't you guys like from the same church? Yeah, and I'm about to get them, boy, I tell you. I'm about to win. I got all my evidence, I got my photos, shoot. They're taking each other to court. Paul's like, oh my goodness. I mean, can you imagine if, if this was like a big conference 
and like all of Paul's churches were represented, they're the people that, you know, look like they're from the streets. I'm just saying. They're the ones that look like, okay, they're who they are. That's Corinth over there. Man, they're a rowdy bunch. (laughs) God bless them. We have the rules for Corinth. Only take one of the communion. They're over there killing it. But that's what they were doing. They were eating. They were getting full off of communion. They were getting drunk off of communion. This is what's going on. I mean, it's funny. Hashtag Bethlehem right there. Yeah. Hey, pastor. Woo. I'm just saying. Maybe it's just this section. No, I'm kidding. I love y'all so much. I love, you know I love you. <laughs> I feel the love. Just kidding. It's you online Facebookers. You're Corinth. No, I'm kidding. The, the point is, is Paul, Paul has this particular Thanksgiving that, that has remarkable optimism. And so I say this to you. I'm remarkably optimistic about our church congregation. I'm remarkably optimistic about what the Lord is going to do here. Because it's not about us. It's about him. Simply, simply, yeah. Let me ask you a few questions. It's not okay, though, for us to remain in our ignorance. It's not okay for us to stay there and for us to desire more our sinful Vegas lifestyle than our amazing holy God. This study should bring clarity that one is greater than the other, which will cause a movement and a progression towards one over the other, a shift. So let me ask you some questions. Do you you know if you are using God's wisdom to make decisions or the wisdom of this world? Do you know, bless you, do you know that? Are you, when, when, how many of you have decisions, this is rhetorical, you know what I'm sure? How many of you have decisions that you have to make this week? I have to make this decision. Are you going to deploy God's wisdom for that decision or the wisdom of this world? Paul, I mean, (laughs) he's going to address that like right out of the gate. Our first, and I'm going to use a light bulb as an illustration next week for various reasons. But clearly these people were still living with their Vegas mentality in the church. It's not okay. Like you got to make a switch. You've got to make a switch. And the Lord is patient and long-suffering, and he'll give you the time to make that switch, but you need to make it. So I'm asking that question. Do you know if you're using the wisdom of God or the wisdom of this world? Let me ask you this. Are you in an immoral relationship? Some of these things are really easy. It's like you either are in an immoral relationship or you're not. You believe that it's okay to have sex outside of marriage or you don't. So Paul's going to confront that. If you want, I can let you know what week I'm going to preach on that when it falls, and you can skip that week. No, I'm kidding. But it's, it's in there. It's in there like swimwear. <laughs> anyway, some of you might get it. Some of you won't. Anyway, that's for your immoral fornicating lifestyle. Are you, are you listen, this is, this is legit stuff. Are you in one? Okay, there's going to be an opportunity there to... Rectify that. Are you continuing to put your feelings in front of your faith? Paul's going to talk about that specifically. Here's a good one. I'm looking forward to this, and we may get some help from the audience on this one. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? He's going to dive into that. Do you have a side of you that denies the miraculous that Scripture teaches? I know there's clearly a side of me that denies that. And this book is challenging me in that. Here's the last one. Do you make light of the ordinances of the church? Do you think it's serious, like what we do? Baptism, Lord's Supper. Here's how we put a bow on this service, okay? Everything that we talked about, is in, it's, it's in our purview of what Paul is gonna address. In this city, this crazy, ancient Vegas, Paul's gonna dive headlong into these things, but before he does, he says, I need, I need you to know where you stand with me. I need you to understand that I'm writing this to you because you're saved, because you're a holy one, because God's grace was given to you. So I have three things that, that I think really define what Paul 
is saying in his greeting and his thanksgiving for them that I think are very helpful. helpful. Listen, there is hope yet. If you're here today, if you're watching online and you feel like there is no hope, if you feel like you can't beat that sin that has been beating you down, if you feel like you cannot forgive that person, if you feel like that relationship is over, if you feel like you cannot raise your children in this modern day age, listen, there is hope. Yet, if you believe that the Lord cannot heal, there is hope for you yet. Here's three things that I see. Paul is really trying to get his point across. Here's the first thing he says in verse four. He says, you are saved because of God's grace, not because of your spirituality. What is in our purview here? We know what's coming. Paul says, you're saints. Look, some of y'all that have been in church a long time need to let this sink in. You're saved because of God's grace, not because of your spirituality. It ain't got nothing to do with it. One comes from the other. Therefore, every church, every religion, every focus that says, I've got to do this and that, and I've got to be this and that, therefore, everyone else who is not this or that are not where I am. Paul says, I'm addressing this based on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in the church of God. You're in the container. You are set apart, not based on what you're not doing, based on what he did. This should give us hope. This should give us grace where we go, oh my goodness gracious, they were missing it. If this was it, they were way over here. And Paul was like, it's okay, you're saints. We're gonna do this thing together. Why? Because Paul knew it wasn't them. If it was going to have to happen, it was going to be Jesus. Listen, we have got to purge ourselves of false doctrine. And one of those is that our goodness and our good works and our spirituality has something to do with our salvation, and it doesn't. If you want to have an off, you know, like a conversation one-on-one about that, I can explain more. But Paul's putting it pretty clear. He's saying in verse 4, I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you. Paul had nothing good to say about the church of Corinth and their good deeds. Not a nothing, not one thing. He had a lot of bad things to say and he said, I thank God for you because you're in the family, you're in the fold. Yes, you are the redheaded stepchild. Yes, you got issues. Yes, you are dysfunctional, but you are saved. You are holy. You are set apart. Let every hypocrite Let every Pharisee take note that God would have someone that is real rather than someone who is always right. Mm. Understand that it is not your spirituality. It is God's grace. So those that are suffering today because of something you're struggling with, I'm not giving you a license to stay in it. I'm just giving you a license to understand that his grace will reach you. It will come to you. You are not too far. Number one, you are saved because of God's grace, not because of your spirituality. Number two, just because you have salvation doesn't mean you fully understand it. Just because you have salvation doesn't mean you fully understand it. Verse number five, it says like that you were enriched in him in every way and in all speech and in all knowledge, but were they? Yes or no? When when God gives you salvation, he gives you all of it. And you're standing there with a million dollars with a three-year-old brain of how to spend it. Where's the candy store? Where's the nearest candy store? I got a million in my hand. I mean, like, my four-year-old would know where, I know where she would go, candy. I know where he would go, new bike. But, But son, it's so much more, it's a million dollars, new bike. Maybe a ramp to ride the new bike on. Maybe a place where I can drive a car with the pedals all the way up. Like his brain, there's nothing in his purview that says retirement, savings, there's an end to said millions. He's like, now, fun, yes. Five-year-old brain, that's okay, I get it. You're five, dude. Some of you are five spiritually. 
and you have the riches of his glory. And you're like, this is amazing. <laughs> and yet you're still yelling at your spouse. I'm, Yang, you don't know how to do a relationship with a coworker if it saved your life, but you got the unsearchable riches of his grace. It's okay. Paul's going to walk us through how to have good relationships with people. He's going to walk us through how to beat that besetting sin. It's okay. Just because you got it all doesn't mean you fully understand it. And, and for those that have been saved a long time, just because you got it all doesn't mean you fully understand it. I don't fully understand it. I'm still, I'm working this thing out. Holy smokes, what do we got? Steve, we have something incredible. We got it all too. Here's the third thing. These are really helpful. These, are, these will help guide us on this study, all right? Number three, it's the third thing, last thing. If you haven't been able to be faithful in your walk, God is still faithful. This one gets me going, it gets me running, it gets me out of bed. Look at verse number nine. Do not miss this. This is what I send you home with. Look at verse nine. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, let me remind you, the final reminder, these people were not faithful. They were not good, not good. Bad things were happening, and what did Paul say? God is faithful to you. What? Okay. There's another 90s reference. Anyway. What? Are you serious? God is right. Yes. God is so faithful to you. Hey, you fornicator. God is faithful to you. Really? Yeah. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. That's KJV for this. God is faithful to you. If you're struggling today, if you can't do today, how many just woke up one day this week and you couldn't do that day? You know what I mean. You just wake up and you're like, I cannot do today. Today is today and I don't like today, therefore I will not do today. I will do any other day other than today. Do you get what I'm saying? That's like saying you don't want to be faithful today. Some of you, there's just, you have propensities to your old life. And Paul's going to address this. You're going to wake up and you're going to want to be old you. I don't want to be new me. Paul is saying in scripture, you are new. You're not that person anymore. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, I can show you right now that I'm that old person. Here's, here's what Paul thinks is important. When we feel that way, Paul thinks it's important to say to you that you're not equipped. He, let, me, let me put it this way. He's not saying to you, you can beat it. You can do it. He's reminding you that God is faithful. If we are to walk away from the problems that we have, it is going to be because we remember that God will always be there and will never walk away from us. We've been doing this thing backwards. You got it, you can do it, you can, let me cheer you on. No, he's got it, he will be there. Do you understand that if you walk out on him, he will not walk out on you? Man, let that sink in. Every person outside of this door that will let you down know that it will not be your God. Father, mother, sister, brother, coworker, boss, whatever loss you are feeling right now, know that you will experience no loss from the Lord. He's given you everything and he will always be faithful to you. If we're gonna be challenged in these areas that are coming, and they're, they're challenging, the only way that we're, we're going to challenge them the correct biblical way is for us to realize that the Lord is faithful to us and that he will continue to work with us and through us. Here's my final, my final benediction here for today. I wrote this. As we journey through this book, it's important to understand that we should continue to be like the one who made us holy, that we prove what he has begun in us, if we neglect our salvation, then we will never change, and therefore we will be unfit for the kingdom of God. But if we are a saint, then a saint we must become. Let us all measure the steps that we must take by the life of our Savior himself. We need not compare, but only trust. We need not boast of spirituality or life change, but rather humbly grow in grace and allow the Spirit to lead us into the kingdom day by day, change by change, until we see the King of Kings face to face. In this letter, we have hope. Only to the one that is willing to hear the problem and follow the solution. 
The problem is our sin, and the solution is our Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Whatever you're facing today, know this, the Lord is faithful. What you're struggling to be faithful in, know this, the Lord is faithful to you, even when you're unfaithful to him. This is the the greeting, the, the salutation, if you will, the introduction to this book of what we will embark on. I don't care today if you're living in some kind of spiritual Vegas. I don't. I don't, it's, it's not really, look, I know we're all in different places. Here's what I care if you stay there. We all need to take a step. Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.